In this video, I'm asking a simple but uh, troubling question for a lot of people. Does God the Father have a form or have a body of some sort? Now, in As far as I understand it, in mainstream Christianity and it, Judaism as well and Islam, the belief that God the Father has a body or has a form is considered to be you know is considered to be blasphemy is considered to be you know rank heresy but you know thinking about it i mentioned in my previous video one of my previous videos when i was talking about uh, theophanies and how in many places in the tanakh in the hebrew scriptures the hebrew portion of the scriptures old testament aka there's occasions where yahweh is said to turn up that is visible and you know Eat, sits down and eats with the patriarchs and this kind of stuff and I was saying that in a lot of those cases we can understand that to be a, a, a the logos actually the the bar the the memra i.e the pre-incarnate Yeshua who turned up and did all those things uh, watch that video if you haven't it's a long video but probably worth it and then I'll tell you how I came onto the question of well does God the Father have a body I'll tell you how I came to this question for some reason, I, oh, that's it. I was watching a, one of those videos, a, a video by uh, Israelite Heritage, which was all about how, you know, which is all about the the physical appearance of the of the Hebrews in biblical times. And in there, one of the, one of the things they talked about was how, in uh, a couple of places, it gives a description of what Yahushua, Yeshua, Jesus would have looked like. And one of those was in Revelation one fourteen and onwards, and it says. This is talking about uh, Yeshua, and it says, uh, actually, I don't like this translation. Uh, this translation, and a lot of translations word it in this way, which is, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet unto like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. Uh, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. Uh, now, in... In the NIV, and I think maybe one other translation, it says, the, the, the way it's worded, it doesn't say his head and his hair were white like wool. It says that the hair, here we go, yeah, the ESV has this uh, translation as well. It says, the hair of his head, the hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. So the, 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 the understanding there is that the color of the hair is what's white, but the hair itself was like wool, like white wool. Who's got woolly hair? Which people in the world have woolly hair? Well, of course, we do. Black people do. Uh, and then it talks about how his feet were like burnished bronze. And bronze, of course, is a dark colour. Which people on the planet do you know who have uh, skin coloured like bronze? It's us, the black people. So woolly hair and skin like dark brown. Now there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, debate over what those terms actually mean. When I look at all the, the the commentaries, actually, almost every single one of them that I can look at, they say no, 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 no. Uh, the the color bronze here is really talking about like a, a a sort of goldy silver. It's like a you know it's it's not dark brown. <laughs> um, but I was thinking about this and I was like, well, actually, the the key to interpreting this verse surely has got to be. A previous verse in the Tanakh which is in Daniel chapter 7 because in Daniel chapter 7 there is a description of someone that sounds quite similar to that almost identical uh, so this is what I was thinking let's, let's go to this previous scripture in Daniel let's see what it says here it says as I looked thrones were placed and the ancient of days took his seat his clothing was white as snow and the, air, the hair of his head like pure wool you see, so this is this is like a parallel, isn't it? This is very similar. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. Uh, and I'll stop there. I won't read the rest of it. But can you see the, see the comparison there, the similarity to the passage in Revelation 1, 14 and 15 talking about Yeshua? Here, this is talking about the Ancient of Days. And we know that this isn't talking about uh, Yeshua. This isn't a, a, a vision of Yeshua because... Later on, a few verses later, it says, I saw in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given, given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people's nations and languages should serve him and so on and so forth. His kingdom will, will not pass away. Um, 
and the point is there. So that definitely, when we're looking at verse nine, that's definitely talking about the father. Um, but the description there, it's it's a very similar to description to the description of Yeshua in Revelation one fourteen. Hair like wool, and this is what this is what it came here is that the control. This is like the control text for Revelation one fourteen. Here it says that the hair was uh, was like pure wool. So. To me, that means that the, the Revelation 1.14 is, is clearly mimicking this passage, if that's the right word. And so Yeshua's hair was white like wool. Uh, and Sorry, was, uh, was like wool. And the whiteness of it is referring to the colour of the hair. But then this got me thinking, well, hang on. Does, does God the Father, does the Ancient of Days, Abba, does he have a physical form of some sort? And I got thinking about it and... It's actually a very interesting question because I think there's, I think there's some evidence that he does. You know, that I, I can't say, think of anywhere in the Bible that says he doesn't have form, even though it's considered to be such a, you know, bad blasphemous thing to say. The Hebrew scriptures, in particular, but also the the New Testament apostolic writings, say otherwise. For example, we don't we all know this one, one of the Beatitudes that Yeshua himself said. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Well, there's a there's a hope that you know for the for the pure in heart that they shall see God. What does it mean to see God? If he is does not have some sort of appearance, some sort of uh, if it's it, think about it. If it's just talking about maybe some people might say no, it means that they will understand God. Well, let's go to First John chapter three, I believe, and there's a. Here we go. Here we go. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. Who's him? The Father. We are God's children. We're not Yeshua's children. We're God's children. We're the Father's children. And we shall see him as he is at some point in the future. Again, what does that mean? We're going to see the Father as he is. This is is it not surely talking about some sort of uh hope that we're going to see the most high uh father we're going to see the father and we're going to be able to you know to see him as he is that means as he actually is you know what what is that saying except we're going to see some sort of physical form some sort of physical manifestation and there's many other scriptures uh there's many many other scriptures that say such a thing i'll go to one more which is in revelation chapter 22 right at the end of the book of or the Bible, the scriptures, it says, it's talking about the, uh, you know, the, this is, I believe, is this the millennium or the after the millennium? Anyway, it's talking about some, what's going to happen in, uh, you know, the ages to come. And it says here, no longer will be there, no longer, in verse three, no longer will be there anything, will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it and his servants will worship him. They will see his face and it, and there's there's passages in other parts of Revelation which make it clear that the name is the name of the Father that is going to be on their foreheads. In fact, maybe I should uh, go to the Treasury of Scripture knowledge to quickly find that. Where is it? Uh, here we go. Cross references. Yeah. So Revelation fourteen one. I don't know if you can read that. It says that uh, the Father's name written on their foreheads, and also. Uh, yeah, chapter 3, verse 12, where Yeshua himself, the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. So this is clearly talking about the name, the Father here. And these, those who are in this uh, this glorious city are going to see his face, the Father's face. Again, what does that mean? Except he has a physical form of some sort to look at. So, and there's many other scriptures. Job makes a similar comment. Uh, David in one of the Psalms says a similar thing as well. So it's really fascinating for me. And um, when I started to think about it and look around, uh, th there's there's some interesting things to, to take in, into consideration. We've, we've been right at the, the beginning of the, the end of the scriptures, rather, in Revelation. If we go right to the beginning, of course, we all know the let us make man in our image scripture. So this is uh, verse 26 of, of Bereshit, Genesis 1. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And in verse 27, so God, Elohim, created man in his own image, in the image of 
Elohim, God, he created him. In Christianity, usually that's said to me, no, 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 it's not, ah, you, don't be silly. It's not appearance, physical appearance. It's talking about, you know, spiritually speaking, we're in the appearance of God or morally, we have the moral similarity to the Most High. But if you look at a, a, a sort of a parallel or, or, or a bit more elaboration, oh, well, go to chapter five and let's read this. Chapter five, uh, this is the book of the generations of Adam or man. When Elohim created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Yeah, male and female who created, he created them and blessed them and named them Adam or man when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image named Seth. So here we go. Here it's when it's talking about Adam fathered Seth in his own likeness, in his own image. It's used in the exact same language as is used with regard to God creating man in his own image and in his own likeness. So the you would think, surely, you would have to think that, well, that means that we are physical. Our appearance is in some way the appearance of the Most High God. Uh, there's passages as well that I looked at in my last video, which I can just mention. So in Exodus 33, verse 20 to 23, where... Uh, Moshe really wants to see God he wants to see Elohim and then he says you know Elohim's like no no one can see me and live and so forth and then right at the end it says verse 20 you cannot see my face for no for man shall not see me and live and Yahweh said behold there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock and while my glory passes by I will put you in the cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back but my face shall not be seen. This language, again, you're probably used to kind of allegorizing it or spiritualizing it in some way. But if you take the sort of plain-ish meaning of the text, it's saying that Moshe saw, well, it's saying, first of all, that Elohim, the father, has a face and that he has a back that Moshe saw. Another scripture, which I just came across the other days, uh, which is a really interesting one, is Numbers chapter 12. And what I'm trying to do is show scriptures, because there's a, we'll all agree there are a whole bunch of scriptures which talk about Yahweh having body parts, hands, eyes, feet, standing, doing this, that and the other. But of course, they'll all be allegorized away to say, no, it's talking spiritually speaking. But these passages are ones where it's like, well, you know, it seems to be making very clear that there is a physical form to Yahweh that is being talked about here. And here's another one, Numbers 12, 5. And Yahweh came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent. I mean, straight away there, there's that kind of language of, well, came down, came down? Came down from where? What do you mean came down? I'll come back to that in a minute. And stood at the entrance of the tent and called Aaron and Miriam. Now, this is the episode where he, uh, Yahweh, uh, turned Miriam white as snow and this is one of the again this is this is relevant to the whole issue of what color let's just say were the ancient Israelites they were obviously dark-skinned people because to turn the skin of a European uh, white as snow isn't a very impressive sign is it but to turn the skin of a black African person or a black person white as snow is an absolutely uh, you know impressive sign but anyway this is that passage this is that incident and he says he says hear my words if there is a prophet among you I Yahweh make myself known to him in a vision and I speak to him in a dream not so with my prophet sorry with my servant Moshe he is faithful in all my house with him verse 8 I speak mouth to mouth clearly and not in riddles and he beholds the form of Yah why then were you were you not afraid to speak to him now to look at how other 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 passage other translations word it, uh, notice there he he's he sees the form Brenton that's a that's the Septuagint but the other ones if you see there the form the form of Yahweh the form of Yahweh he sees the form of Yahweh what does it mean to see the form of Yahweh if Yahweh doesn't have a form well how, how could how could Moshe have seen the form of Yahweh and then that takes me to a passage in. Yohanan, John, back to the apostolic writings, John chapter 5, oops, oh, hold on, John chapter 5 verse 37, 
and it says the father who sent me has born has himself borne witness about me his voice you have never heard his form you have never seen now he's talking to a set of particular group of people here i believe who's he talking to he's probably talking to like the chief priests and the or the, the some pharisees or another who were asking him yeah the jews the yehudim were questioning him and he says you've never heard his voice fine yahweh has the father has a voice and they've never heard it and his form you have never seen well if he hasn't got a form what point would there be in yeshua saying this do you see what i mean so there are many 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 kind of these are like control texts for me that when you look at these kinds of texts you have to start to consider well maybe the father does have a form and maybe some people have seen this form like Moshe and maybe that we're all going to see the form those of us who are found worthy to enter into the kingdom are going to see the form the physical form of Yahweh now we all know Psalm 110 and I'm picking Psalm 110 because it's one of my favorite Psalms it's one of the most important Psalms to the Yehoshua movement if you like in the New Testament uh, and it says of course Yahweh says to Adoni or Adonai Yahweh says to Adoni sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool so all right we all know that but what does it mean for Yeshua to be seated at the right hand of the father what does it mean for the father to be seated what what does that actually mean if the father doesn't have some sort of physical presence some sort of physical form similarly when we go to Stephen the great Stephen, you know, his speech when he, uh, which got him killed. And then when he was just about to be stoned, we read this. When he was just about to be stoned to death, it says, But he, full of the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus, Yeshua, standing at the right hand of God. What does it mean to be at the right hand of God? If God is just everywhere and immaterial and formless, how can you be at the right hand of him? And then Stephen reported it. He said, he said, behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of Elohim. Standing at the right hand of God, the Father. You see? So the Father, the picture there is that the Father is seated on his throne. Like we, This is referring back to Daniel hinting at, at Psalm 110 as well. That whole motif of the Son of Man being at the right hand of the Father you know it's a very important theological motif but when you think about it it also tells us it also tells us that the fact that the father surely has a physical form because how can you be at the right hand how can you be sat down and so forth so what i'm saying is that we probably and i'm not a hundred yet a hundred percent but i'm probably 85 percent we probably need to start to be taking some of the, a lot of the scriptures a lot more literally than we have been used to taking them because otherwise you start to have to question explain away spiritualize away a bunch of things in there to do with being able to see Yah and so forth now the only scripture that i know of that it, it, it appears to be brought up to try and prove that the father does not have a form uh is in where is it i think it's john chapter four you know the one where it basically says god is spirit where is it where is it where is it here we go so when it's when um here we go so this is when yeshua is talking to this the woman of samaria the samaritan woman and he says he says god uh, talking about the father is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth so the the, the statement here taken into comparing this with something else that's written in luke chapter 24 where Yeshua is trying to convince the disciples that it really is him and they're thinking oh I've seen a ghost and he says no what do you mean how can you have seen it and anyway I'll show you he says see my hands and feet that it is I myself touch me and see for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have so the idea is well God the Father is spirit and spirit doesn't have flesh and bones so God the Father doesn't have flesh and bones and it's a, it's an interesting point the fact that that's the strongest kind of argument against the father having a physical form to me demonstrates the weight of evidence is strongly in favor of the father having a physical form 
But even just looking at that passage, you know, Yeshua is there talking about worshipping in spirit and in truth, uh, not just worshipping at the in Jerusalem, Jerusalem, and so on. Um, you know, if the Father does have a physical form, that, A, he doesn't necessarily have to have uh, flesh and bone, you know, because there's different types of uh, body. As Let's talk about it, actually. Let's quickly go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul goes into a bit of a detailed excursus about this. And he says, he's talking about the resurrection body and how it's different from the body that was sown, i.e. The, the, the mortal body that was sown in death or that was changed. And he says, not all flesh is the same, that there is one kind for humans and another kind for animals and another for birds and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind and the glory of the earthly is of another kind and it goes on there is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon another glory of the stars the stars differ and star differs from star in glory and so on and then we well i'll carry on so it is with the resurrection of the dead it is what is sown perishable is raised imperishable it's sown in dishonor it's raised in glory it's sown in weakness it's raised in power it's sown a natural body it's raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first Adam, first man became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural and then the spiritual. The first man was of earth, from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the dust, we shall also brought, bear the image of the man of heaven. And and basically, and then it talks about this: flesh and blood will not cannot inherit the kingdom of God as well. Nor does the perishable inherit the, the imperishable. So what seems to be getting at here? What I'm saying here is that Paul is making the point that there is a body, there is a spiritual body. The spiritual body is not flesh and blood; it's something else. It's of some kind of different order to the natural body, and so. Could we not conclude that same thing with regard to God the Father? He is not of, you know, he's not flesh and bone or flesh and blood, but he does have a body, apparently, based on all the scriptures I've looked at, and many, 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 many more that I can talk about. And that body is not a body of flesh and blood. It's not a body of flesh and bone, but it is a body. It is physical and it is material. And we shall see him if we are pure in heart, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see the Father. And what are the ramifications of this understanding, of this, if this is the case that the Father does have a form? And again, most Christians will consider this rank heresy. Muslims definitely would. Uh, in Judaism, it definitely is considered heresy, even though early on, and obviously in the scriptures. <laughs> What's the ramifications? Well, I, Maybe that's something for me to talk about in, an, in a different video, but I guess it means that we can take a lot a lot more of the scriptures just on face value and, and it, it, it demystifies God the Father, I think you could say, you know, rather than just being this amorphous, invisible, non, you know, immaterial uh, entity that is everywhere but nowhere in no one particular, no specific place anywhere and, you know, no, rather than rather than that, he he is a being. He has a body, just like we have bodies. He made us in his image. So I suppose that's another big ramification: is that it it really does make me value the physical body more because this physical body that it's not that it's not that we are a spirit. We have a body, and um, what's that phrase? You are a spirit. You live in a body, and you have a soul or something. No, we are who we are. We are human beings. I mean, we can, you know, we are made in the image of the Most High, and that's referring. Yes, it may well be referring to other aspects of our of us. So being able to rationalize and think and whatever and love and whatever, but it's also talking about our appearance. We are made in the likeness and the image of the Most High God. So we must value our physicality, value our body, because it is the image of the Most High. We, we are made in the likeness of the Most High Father. Just as Yeshua is the express image of the Most High Father. You know, um, so there's that. And 
as I say, it demystifies, it'll demystify God the Father, and make him a lot more, you know, r- relatable. Um, yeah, so those those are just some of the things that, that I can think of. But I'd be interested if anyone's got this far, let me know what you think about this whole concept of God the Father having a body. And uh, yeah, of course, I'm always open. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not being dogmatic about this. And I don't think this is clearly, for me, this is not some sort of issue that's, you know, absolutely critical, but I think it's a, it's a it's an important issue. It's a fascinating issue, and it's an issue that could have real uh, ramifications as far as how we live our lives, how we value our bodies, how we value material things. Because, the, sorry to carry on, but one last thing is that, you know, the understanding that you know the, the material that the, the the physical is somehow not as important as the immaterial. It comes or is made famous and popularized by Greek. Uh, philosophy in Greek philosophy, there is that understanding of, you know, basically the the thing that is more real is the immaterial, is the in, is the invisible thing, and you know the idea of God having a material form is horrible for them. So that's you know they're all about the the spiritual, all about the immaterial, and so forth. Whereas in Hebraic understanding, when you look through the scriptures right from the beginning of of uh, of the Bereshit from Genesis chapter, you know. Chapter two, you got you got uh, Elo- Yahweh Elohim there making man from the dust of the earth and blowing blowing into his nostrils uh, to to turn man into a life give a life uh, as we read in as Paul kind of hinted at it in First Corinthians, Yahweh Elohim formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the lamb, man became a living creature. You know Yahweh is physically interacting with his creation. Likewise, uh, in in chapter three, after they'd sinned against him and done what you know they said not to do, eat from that tree, you see, they heard the sound of Yahweh Elohim, Elohim walking in the garden in the cool of the day, you know, and so on and so forth. All those theophanies that were, that I talked about in my other video, all those theophanies, you know, we're getting at the point that Yahweh is in the Hebrew scriptures is physical, is manifested, is engaging, is interacting with the physical. Uh, his interaction with the with the physical realm he made the physical realm and he said it was good so that's the difference and maybe this is a, an issue with regard to hebraic versus greek philosophy anyway let me know what you think i'll speak to you soon peace out he bless may the most high bless you and keep you and may his face shine upon you hallelujah praise god amen